a lot of times when people tell me to be prepared for whatever it is that I'm about to look at, you just never really can be totally prepared. And this was definitely one of those times. I guess what really was surprising to me was just the level of organization that I saw once I got in the basement of the house. Almost every box is actually labeled, which made it pretty exciting to dig through because I'm like, if everything is actually what it says on the box, this is going to make for an easy pick. Now, if it ain't, that's when it gets a little more difficult. I'm going to go through every box regardless because I'm not going to just trust what's on the label. But the fact that this guy was an eBay seller at one point in time makes me want to definitely pick through and make sure that I'm not missing something that could potentially be really, really rare. I love picks like this because it allows me to get a lot of inventory for my storefront, BC Modern. We specialize in items from the 1950s through the 1970s, and my store is 5,000 square feet, so I need a lot of stuff every single month for every single event. And what I can say is there ain't no shortage of stuff in this basement. So I'm gonna start digging. I'm gonna take you along with me through as many boxes as I possibly can. And we'll show you some stuff along the way. I can already tell that this guy had a really good eye for picking quality stuff. So that makes me pretty excited to do this pick also. It's one thing when you get to a house and it's just all garbage, but a house like this, I could potentially see that there's gonna be some really good stuff that I find. So I started way in the back of the basement and from the very beginning, I could see that this guy was into a lot of architectural kind of items. So a lot of old life fixtures, old light shades, of things of that nature, and a lot of hardware too. Now I've had really good success with that kind of stuff in the past. Things like old doorknobs, old slip shade fixtures. That was actually one of my biggest home runs and I think 2022 in a basement in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, I ended up finding some old glass slip shades. Here, I'll put an example on the screen so you can know what I'm talking about. And I got thousands of dollars for those things, which was crazy. So you gotta love picking basements because you just never know what you're gonna find. No slip shades just yet, but I did find my first piece to take with me. In Wisconsin, almost every private estate that I picked through has some kind of beer signs. Here's another beer sign. I don't know if this one actually is all together or if it's missing pieces or if it even actually all goes together, like how I found it. I'm going to play around with it a little bit to see if I can get it to work or see how it's supposed to fit. I know it's got this little point on the top of it. And then when you put the shade on the point, the heat from the bulb makes it turn around or something to that effect. So I'm hoping that I got all the pieces here and I can actually make this work and bring it back to life. I'm still gonna stick it in my pile, even if I don't have all the pieces, but I'm pretty sure it's all here. Sometimes the parts are actually worth more than the piece altogether. Stuff like this, where it's usually like damaged or thrown away, that's usually a good sign for me to grab it and take it with me. So go on with me too. Look at the little poodle thermos. No, I'm taking that with me. On the same shelf that I grabbed the thermos from, you can see there's a bunch of planters and I'm taking those for sure because we got at least 60 plants in our store. So we're always looking for more planters, especially the cool ones that actually match our store aesthetic. Okay, small bar glasses. You think that's what's in there? I don't know, but like I said at the beginning, almost everything in this place is labeled. So that's making this pick a lot more easy. So situations like this, most times people, they actually want me to kind of do a buyout. And I definitely could have made him an offer to buy out everything. But the more I started to look around on that first day when I came to evaluate the house, I realized that I would be just hauling a lot of stuff out of here that I just do not want. And that's where I switched gears and just kind of let the client know, hey, I can't buy everything. I can refer you to somebody else after me when I'm done, but I'll go through here and I'm gonna pick and find all the stuff that I'm very much interested in and I'll pay you fair on that stuff. So anytime you're hearing that little cha-ching sound, that means that's a piece that I found that I'm gonna take with me, either to sell on eBay or to sell in my store. As an eBay seller, he must've sold a lot of glass brand pottery and I, I can't, I don't envy that because that's a whole lot of packing material and a lot of liability to get stuff from point A to point B. Definitely not shy to ship fragile items, but it's not at the top of the list of things that I would personally want to put online. A lot of what I was seeing in the house is also things that were a lot more popular, I would say 10, 15 years ago on eBay, which is another telltale sign that this isn't an estate that I would want to make an, like an outright purchase for everything. Even though there's some things here that definitely have some really good value, there's gonna be a lot of just hauling stuff and donating. And that's what like a lot of clean outs and estate buyouts end up being is 
you're just hauling stuff and emptying out a space for people. And that takes time, that takes money. So I really try to make my time more useful by digging and looking for the things that I am actually interested in, things that actually bring me some kind of enjoyment versus just things that I know I can resell for profit. Because if you're going to chase that metric, literally you can, there's, you can sell everything. Everything can be sold. So at what point do you stop and just say, you know what? This is too much stuff. I got too much stuff. I'm never going to get through it. And here I am saying that. And I still have too much stuff. And I only buy the stuff that I like. Imagine if you just bought any and everything that came your way, which a lot of resellers do. I look for things that I know right away I can resell in my store or on eBay. Like Pyrex. These are things that I can sell in my store. It's stuff that I actually personally collect at home. We got a huge Pyrex collection at our store. And also one at my house that nobody really gets to see but. I got Pyrex too. I actually pulled some new in the box stuff not too long ago that I'm going to stick on eBay this week too. All Pyrex. That's the crazy thing about Pyrex though. You find the right pattern. Oh my God, it's game changing. Do not sleep on vintage Pyrex. You just never know. I am really, really all about condition too. Making sure that everything is in good condition. All the parts are there. I'm not the one that likes to sell things and have to give like disclaimers on issues that are related to the items. I would much rather stick my price on it. And if it's in good enough condition, you're just going to pay the price. So you'll see in video, sometimes I'll leave things that are damaged or or missing components. The only time I really sell damaged goods or things that are missing components is going to be on eBay because it's usually going to be something that's usually really unusual or rare and those missing pieces aren't going to make a very big difference in the asking price or the final hammer price because I only do auctions. But if it's things for my store, it's got to be in perfect condition. I don't even like bringing stuff in with scratches and that's just my crazy OCD standard. Actually, my wife kind of got that standard too. So it's both our crazy OCD standard, but everybody operates differently. And I don't try to influence anybody by what I do. I just, I'm just sharing my story along the way and, you know, hope that some people appreciate it. Here's a piece of vintage brand Briggle. I think it's Van Briggle. That's how you say it. Pottery. Names on the bottom. I love it with the little matte finish. Okay, seriously, how good is this little lunchbox? Let me see, open up. I want to see what's inside of it, though. Got the thermos. The value just went up. Cha-ching. I don't got to make the sound. I could just use the sound effect, right? Yeah, I could do that. Stop thinking you're going to get rich quick off of reselling because there ain't nothing you can do that you can get rich off of quickly. Reselling is one of those things that when I first started doing it and I realized, I'm like, man, I can make a dollar reselling this, I can make $5 profit selling this item that I knew in a course of my entire life, I would see over a million dollars in sales. I won't see it in one time, but I'll see it over a course of time. And it's like untapped, uncapped potential too. So that's what's so amazing about this kind of business is because literally every day is a treasure hunt and you have unlimited earning potential. One of my biggest weaknesses as a reseller is vintage toys. I don't know if it's really a weakness or a strength because I sell a lot of vintage toys, but my weakness is I don't pass up on a lot of vintage toys because I want them all, especially old boys toys. Like I didn't get many toys as a kid. So as an adult now, I buy any and every toy I can because I like to be the guy that actually brings it to market. I think that's pretty cool when I find these things and I can be like, hey, look what I found. Now I get to sell it. Is that weird? If you check out these videos I did a couple months ago where I was talking about my top categories that I sell in, you're going to see vintage toys has been up there for the last two years straight. And it probably will be number one, if not number two this year also. Don't sleep on vintage toys. Okay, my other weakness is new in the box. This kind of goes back to what I mean when I say I don't want things to have issues with them. You come into my store, I want you to see this on the shelf and be like, man, it's brand new. Nobody ever touched it. New old stock. N-O-S. Vintage new old stock. Sometimes we just actually use the items that are new old stock as display in our store just for the aesthetic. It all helps create an experience and that's what I want people to have when they come to my store. We sell a lot of vintage drinkware in my store. So it's always on the top of the list of things that I'm looking for. I'm usually looking for things that I can put into sets of fours, sixes, eights. The odd number sets just don't do very well for me. So in the case that I do end up with an odd number, I just take the odd pieces out and I put them to the side and I just hold on to them until I'm able to build 
another set of four or another set of six or another set of eight. Just looking in this box, it looks like there's several sets that are already here, but I'm just going to take the entire box and I'll figure it out once I get it to my warehouse and I can unpack everything. What's cool about this pick too is that I'm able to see at a certain point, like this was when things were a lot better at thrifting. Like you can't even find some of this stuff when you go to thrift stores anymore. And I'm not just saying what you're looking at on the screen. I'm just saying some of the stuff that he's found and for the prices he was paying, is just unheard of in today's thrifting market. I think that's pretty cool because I don't do thrifting like everybody else where they're kind of going out every single day and that's how they're making a living. Like this is what this guy was doing. He was thrifting to make a living. But I can appreciate the fact that the thrift stores are constantly putting stuff out all day, every day. And for that reason, that's why I will go to thrift stores. Of course, my perfect case scenario is me picking through homes like this every single day, but every house isn't going to look like this. Every house isn't going to have this much stuff. Every house isn't going to be clean and organized. And every house ain't calling me to come do this. So you got to go to thrift stores. It's a constant source of inventory if you're a reseller. And no lie, if you watching a video like this, yeah, there are times when the thrift stores used to be a lot more plentiful. But this has got to give you hope to get up off your couch and get up and go look for some stuff because there is inventory out here and there's good stuff out here. The key is actually understanding what you're looking at. And I can tell, I think I said this at the beginning of the video, that he had a good eye. And that's where it starts is everything can't be uh, looked up really quick or a Google search or a Google lens. Sometimes you got to actually know like, hey, that's a quality piece. That's a little different than what I normally see. When you start to know those things it makes shopping a lot more easy for yourself. I see so many people get online and they're like, hey, I got this for, you know, five bucks. I sold it for 50 bucks. And that becomes the shock factor or that becomes what adds value to the video, what somebody paid for an item and what they sold it for. That's not the real bag. The real bag is actually knowing what to look for understanding time periods and materials, understanding little odd things that make something different. I would much rather show you things that you probably wouldn't think to buy to kind of provide a different viewpoint on how you can actually make money reselling. Hey, and at the end of the day, this might not be as interesting as those other videos, but I'm just trying to stay true to myself and I'm not going to give you clickbait type content. That's not what I want to stick out. If you see anything in my video that you have questions about, please feel free, drop it in the comments and I'll try my best to explain to you what it is or why I bought it or why I didn't buy it. Of course, I couldn't show you everything in this house because I think I'm probably at about hour three at this point in the video and it's only probably like 10 minutes long so far but just know that i went through almost every box down here looking for stuff and you're gonna hit some home runs but there was definitely a nice share of duds down here too so we keep digging we keep stacking our bases waiting for that home run to come out all in all i spent about four four and a half hours here the client was super nice he had cookies he had banana nut bread he had water there for us, which is important because you get fatigued digging through this stuff. Like seriously, you're definitely running on adrenaline because you're on a hunt and that's what everybody loves is the hunt, right? Digging. And then when you find that piece and you're like, ah, yes, it gives you a little bit more energy to keep going, but you got to put some fuel in your system because although you find some home runs like this Robin Hood, what is it? Robin Hood flower. I think that's what it was. Display with, hold on, let me show you. Inside, it actually has everything is still complete so you can find some home runs but in the meanwhile when you ain't finding no home runs you're gonna need some energy to keep going i try to eat like two to three hours every day keep going because this is the kind of business that you need that energy like you only see me digging through this basement i still gotta pack all this stuff up that means it's got to get wrapped it's got to get carried up from the basement it's got to get loaded into the van and that requires energy. You got to need some fuel if you want to do this job. At my height of reselling, I actually had employees and we had multiple warehouses full of stuff. And I kept everybody busy by buying entire estates and collections on a continuous basis. But once I got rid of all of that extra space, all that extra stuff and all the extra people around me, I kind of realized how out of shape I was. How if I wanted to really continue doing this job, I needed to start taking my health a little bit more seriously. 
So that's why I eat every three to four hours. I get up, I work out every single morning because I enjoy being a reseller. And I know that if I want to keep doing this job and doing it effectively, I got to take care of myself. Either that or I got to start hiring people again. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'd much rather take care of myself and I'll do the work. If I need help, I'll just contract it out. But nine times out of 10, I'm taking care of it myself. And I'm taking the steps every day to make sure that I can have longevity in this business. When I look back and think like, man, I've been doing this 20 years. It's seems like yesterday I started. But when I look at the knowledge that I've gained and how far I've gotten in this business, I know that, you know, physically and mentally, none of this happened overnight. I'm a firm believer in having those tough conversations with yourself because I thought like, man, I need employees. There is no way I can build this company to where it's at right now without help. It can be done, but it starts with you, you know? So another thing that you'll see me preach and talk about as a reseller is taking care of yourself because I do think that that's important. I don't know how you can effectively do this kind of job and be in bad health. It's just not recommended. I've seen way too many resellers just let their lives go down the drain by not taking care of themselves. So I spent four and a half hours picking through the basement of that estate. We got a lot of stuff. Now I'm over at the BC Modern Depot. I need to get all this stuff unpacked, unboxed. So I got most of the van emptied out. That's just all empty boxes back there. I still got my big, what a smart back there. I still got my big bags to get out of here, but um, I got my orders this morning from my wife. She's like, bring me all the Texas wear bowls. So I don't think I'm gonna unpack this one. I'm just gonna show you guys kind of what's in this bag. And then this one has a bunch more. So she was like, as many as you find today, just bring them in. So I think I'm just gonna take the whole bag. So I'll unpack those two, well not unpack, but I need to get those two bags out of there, get the art out of here and get the um, the empty boxes out of here. And then that's all unpacked. 